Welcome back to our class. We continue our study on the fourth commandment, and we've been looking at the foundational background to this particular commandment in particular. Why? Because this commandment is so misunderstood as to the importance as to why we're to keep the Sabbath holy. So let's return back to our scripture, looking at Exodus chapter 20, looking at verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, if you recall, we're still looking at the background, and this is dealing with the people of Israel. They've been set free from Egypt out of captivity, and what you have here is the people imagining that they're already on the road. They're already on the road. They've left Egypt. They're somewhere between Egypt into the desert and in, in the Canaan and the promised land, and God gives them a commandment. This commandment of the Sabbath day is already established prior to it being formally declared in Exodus chapter 20. It's declared, back in, it's declared back in Exodus chapter 16 in the most practical way. The people will have to depend and learn to depend upon God for their daily provisions. That is the main reason behind the Sabbath day, that we would keep them holy because we depend upon a righteous, merciful creator, a loving father. Now, in Exodus chapter 16, you recall in verse 4, uh, God tells Moses to tell the people, and this is a conversation that has, and he says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out, shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. This is the test. This is the test as to why we see this great commandment being established here. Now, if you recall, we left off. Um, and we gave eight reasons last in our last session discussing as to the importance of this commandment and why they were to arise so early in the morning to depend upon get God's daily provision. You see, once the sun rises, all of the other activities of the world begin to compete and crowd in. There is very little to slim to none that you will actually spend some time in a devotion, worship, and prayer, reading God's word, hearing his voice, so that you may be able to be fortified throughout that day because we have to learn to depend upon God on a daily basis, on a daily basis. So here's a thought that I want to share with you as we continue to embark on this discussion of the detailed foundational background information as to this commandment. There is a strong lesson here about storing up and hoarding the manna. We must never hide nor hoard the bread from heaven. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only spiritual food that can satisfy the human heart. We must therefore share the, share the bread of life, Jesus Christ, with the world. Now, you recall the same way the people had attempted to hoard the food from heaven, we are not, we cannot make that mistake spiritually as well. We are required to share with one another so that all will have sufficient to eat. Here, spiritually speaking, we cannot hoard the bread of life. We cannot hoard Jesus Christ and keep him to us for and no more. So I want to draw that, uh, this principle to you. If you'll be so kind, turn to Acts chapter 1, please. Acts chapter 1, and look with me in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and look at verse 8. We all know these verses, but I want you to see them in a different light. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then notice this, because everybody understands this verse, but look at the second half, the reason why you receive the power. It says this, but he says, and he says, and he says, and he says but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my what? My witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. You see, we're to share this bread of life that's come from heaven. We see this in Acts chapter 4. Notice what it also says in verse 20 toward the end. He says this in verse 20. He says, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Yet 
the Christian mouth has seemed to come to a close just the same as a dumb idol, a statue. Look what he says in Acts chapter 5. Look what he says here in Acts 5 and verse 20. It says this. He says, he says, go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of what? Of this life. Look what he tells us in 2 Timothy in chapter 1, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I want to draw your attention to this and because I want you to understand what we're required to do with this manner. In 2 Timothy, look what he says in chapter 1 in verse 8. He says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Amen. Look what he says in Titus chapter 2. Let's go to Titus chapter 2 after the second book of Timothy. And look what he says here in verse 15. He says this. He said, these things speak and exhort. These things, the word of God, the testimonies of the word of God, exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. No one to disregard you. We see this in 1 Peter as well in chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Note what he says to us here in verse 15. The word of God says this. But sanctify Christ as the Lord in your hearts, always being what? ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So notice this. There is this strong lesson here that we have to draw for us today in a postmodern era about storing up and hoarding the manna. We must never hide nor hoard the bread from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only spiritual food that can satisfy the human heart. We must therefore share the bread of life, Jesus Christ, with, one, with, with the world. You see, the people who had crossed the desert, Israel at the time, we began to hoard because they did not trust. We do the same thing today in the church of the living God. We refuse to share the word of God. We hoard it all onto ourselves. We're just as guilty as they then were. So now, let's look at number three. God's third command was also disobeyed. Should we be surprised? God's third command was also disobeyed. Go back to Exodus chapter 16 and look at this with me in verses 22 to 27, please. Now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. Remember, an omer was the equivalent of two quarts. So in this case, it would be four quarts. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, and he, then he said to them, This is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over put aside to, ki- to be kept until morning. So they, they received very specific instructions. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered, and it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. So up until this point, they have obeyed. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now, now look what happens in verse 27. Didn't take long. It came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They immediately violated the Sabbath, which is what? The day of rest. Once again, let me remind you, the Sabbath is not Saturday. It's the day of rest. God commanded the people to gather twice as much bread on the sixth day, two omers. And now two omers would have been one omer is one quart, uh, is two quarts. Now two omers would be four quarts for each person. This is more than enough food for each person. God lavished his provision upon them, if you will. So note what happened. The people gathered twice as much bread on the sixth day, and the rulers gave the good report to Moses. We see that, right? Because in, in Exodus uh, 16, 22, uh, now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses. So Moses hears the good news. Amen? 
the people were supposed to cook what was needed for the Sabbath on the sixth day, right? Why? Because the Sabbath was a day of rest, a holy day to the Lord. So, in this case, on the sixth day, because the seventh day was going to be the rest, the day of rest, they were supposed to cook all their meals for the seventh day have it already prepared this is what he tells them in verse 23 then he said to them this is what the lord meant tomorrow is a sabbath observance a holy sabbath to the lord bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil all that is left over put aside to be kept on what until the morning the next day is when they would partake of this food now look at this now the question is did the people obey god did they i have no idea we're going about to find out well we know that some did we know that some did. And the manna did not stink nor get maggots in it, right? Because we know that in 1624, in Exodus says, So they put it aside until the morning as Moses had ordered, <coughs> excuse me, and it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. So, so far we're doing good. So far we're doing good, right? Now note what the messenger of God did. He, he re-stressed, he re-emphasized the third commandment. Again, notice what he's saying to him. He's repeating this. Look at verse 25 and 26. Just like you know how you have to repeat your commandments to your children? All of you know what I'm talking about? Here he is, Moses, speaking again. Now, you know, one of, this is one of the issues in the church today. The preacher must constantly be repeating, 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 and people get all kinds bent out of shape, and, and they get upset. This is what we're called to do. Peter tells us that very clearly. We're to remember, we're to constantly be reminding you of the Word of God. Here, Moses is reminding them again. Look at verse 25 and 26. He says, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So he's being very clear here. He's now repeated himself clearly here so they would understand this, right? The point is clear. The Sabbath day was to be given, was, was to, be given, to, the day, to be given to the Lord. This is what they were doing. Because verse 25 says that. He says, he says eat it today, for today is a, Sabbath, is, is a Sabbath to the Lord. So it was to be given to him. Okay. Six days they were to be used for gathering food, but no food was to be gathered on the Sabbath day. Clearly, this is stated here in verse 26. Okay. So God had his messenger stress the command time and again. Okay. There could be no misunderstanding. The people knew exactly what they were to do. They knew exactly what they were to do, just like today. Again, the question is, did the people obey God? Some did not. They disobeyed God. We know that because in verse 27 it says, It came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They went out. It didn't matter what God had told them to do. Despite the very clear, unquestionable command of God, some of the people deliberately chose to act on their own, to do their quote-unquote their own thing. Isn't that how we have a lot of people in the church today? They rebelled against God's command and disobeyed him. They went out on the Sabbath day to gather manna, but no, they found none. They were completely frustrated. So now, the question becomes, what was God's response? Ah, now this gets interesting, okay? What did he do? He rebuked the people and gave a strong charge to them. He rebuked them. This is what Exodus chapter 16 tells us. Look at verse now 28, 29, and 30. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? You notice that? That's really, that's really important that you notice this in verse 28. Okay? You know, God rebukes the leader. He rebukes the leader. He rebukes them strongly. Okay. Why? Because he represents his people. See, that's probably one of the greatest struggles that a, a lot of preachers have today in the church is because the people do not understand or they do understand and they don't care. You remember in the study in the book of Revelations of the message, the, the, the message that was sent to the messengers of the churches in, in, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. You remember that, right? And you see there that God is rebuking the leader and the church okay? because the leader represents the churches. Okay. And here, the, Moses represents Israel. And so the leadership always takes a big hit because of the membership and the followers. Okay. And you, I'm the first one to get rebuked if I'm the leader. 
I have to pay the price. In fact, we're also told that I have to give an account for every single one of you as a preacher, as a pastor of a local church. Every single pastor will have to give an account. Now look at this. So he tells him in verse 20, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Verse 29, see the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you bread for two days. On the sixth day, remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of, of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. What do we see here? So we see in verse 28 that he rebuked them with a question. How long would they, would they disobey him in his laws? He gave them a strong charge. They must keep in mind that the Lord himself established the Sabbath. This was not Moses. This was not the preacher. This was not the denomination. It was God who established the Sabbath. The facts were very clear here. The Lord had given six days to gather bread and to work. We see this in verse 29, Exodus 16, 29. The Lord demanded that everyone rest and worship on the Sabbath day. Again, we see this in verse 16, 29. And we note the people obeyed. We know that because on verse 30, finally, we get this. Now, there are two clear lessons seen here in this experience of Israel. So let's begin to kind of put this in some kind of context that we can relate to. Number one, we must obey God. Now, I know that sounds rather elemental, rather basic. We must obey God. God means what he says, and he expects us to obey him. We must never disobey, not deliberately, not in rebellion. And yet, this is exactly what happens continuously. Now, look at Exodus chapter 19 with me. And look at what it says here in verse 5. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of all the earth is mine. Amen? This is what he says here. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, please. And look at what the scriptures tells us here in verse 29. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, look what he says in verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Go, say to them, return to your tents. Amen? Look what he says in the same book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26. Go with me to verse 16. In Deuteronomy, chapter 26, in verse 16, we see this great commandment. And notice what he says here. He tells them here in verse 16, he says, This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and these ordinances. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart, and with all your soul. Notice he doesn't ask them for their consideration. He doesn't ask them to pray about it. He doesn't ask them to vote on it. He doesn't ask them to meet with a committee. He doesn't ask them to find out if this, this is a command. It is not a recommendation. It's not a suggestion. It's not an opinion. It's not a good idea. This is a command. We go to Joshua chapter 1. Now go to Joshua, please, and look at this in chapter 1, and look what he tells us here in verse 8. He says in Joshua 1a, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your, your way prosperous and then you will have success. Amen. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, please. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I want you to see this in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and note what the word of God says to us in verse 22. Samuel said this, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Does he? As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the rams. Amen? 1 Kings chapter 3, look what he says here. 1 Kings chapter 3. Note what he tells us here in verse 14. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 14, the word of God comes to us in a very clear way. He says, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes. Now, you remember the word walk in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. The word walk means if you live, to live out. If you walk in my ways of keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Amen. Amen. 
Let's go to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 7, please. In Matthew chapter 7. And note again what this verse says. You notice that we keep repeating these verses over and over again. My, pur my purpose is to drive you back into the text that you will hear the word of God. It's not my voice, but the word of God. In Matthew, in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Amen? Look at that same chapter, Matthew 7. Look at what he says in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Amen. Go to now to the book of John in John chapter 14. And note what he says to us here in John chapter 14. And look at specifically verse 23. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. Look what he says in John 15. Look at verse 10. He says, If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Look what he says here in verse 14. He says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Go now to Revelation chapter 22. In Revelation chapter 22, and note what he says to us here at the end. And he says to us here in verse 14, he says this. He said, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to what? So that they may have the right, he says, to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Amen? You see, so we must keep the law day every week. We need to be a people who are obedient. Now go back to Exodus chapter 16 with me and I want to draw your attention here. Look what he says in Exodus chapter 16 because you and I need to comprehend the importance of how we apply this commandment into our postmodern situation. Why? Because the Word of God transcends, it transcends all of the cultures all of the ages, because it, the Bible tells us that he is the same today, yesterday, yesterday, today, and forevermore. His word is eternal. It is without beginning and without end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. We know, we know that the book of Colossians tells us that Jesus okay, is, was involved in the creation. Everything was made in and through him and for him. We understand that. We understand that God is our Father. He is the Creator. We are the Creator. And thus, we must submit to him and to him alone. Welcome back to our class. We're studying the Ten Commandments, and specifically we're looking at the Fourth Commandment that we find here in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. This is lecture number 13, part 2. And let's begin to look at this, where he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall, he says, labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall, do not, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Now, up until this point, we have been looking at and studying a little bit more detail, the foundational background to this commandment, the fourth commandment, where he tells us, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. Holy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it 
holy. So we have been having, in our last class, in our last session, we were looking at its modern day application, how we look at it, as well as looking for the last three or four classes, looking at the foundational background. Let's just finish up with this last part today so that we get a better grasp and understanding of what is being discussed here. And if you recall, we had talked about two clear lessons that are seen in the experience of Israel. And we said, number one, that we must obey God and God means what he says and he expects us to obey him. We must, we must not disobey him deliberately and not in rebellion. And if you recall, in our last session, we looked at Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16. We looked at Joshua 1, 8, 1 Samuel 15, 22. We looked at 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 14. And then we went into the New Testament and began to look a little bit deeper into Matthew chapter 7, 21, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. We looked at John 14, 23. We looked at John 15, 10 and John 15, 14, and then we ended up with Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. So we looked at that first lesson. Let's look at the second lesson, and that is this. Number two, we must keep the Lord's day every week. We must keep the Lord's day every week. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 16, verse 23 in particular. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. You see that? This is what he meant. He says this. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over put aside and keep until morning. Now the Lord's day is A, a day of rest, and B, a holy day to the Lord. I think we have forgotten that in the modern era. For us, it's baseball, and I love baseball. It's basketball, I love basketball. It's football, I love football. It's going out, you know, I like going out. It's the restaurant, it's the, I like going to the restaurant, okay? You know, whatever it is, the activities happen to be, okay? But I need you to understand that day belongs to the Lord. We have completely forgotten that. That's the day that the malls are going crazy, the stores are going crazy, there's, there are holiday, there's all kinds of bargains going on, and the world has sucked you in to their system, and we violate that day, and we think that we have not violated because we showed up in some church service on that day in some building called the church somewhere, and we, and we graciously gave an hour or two hours of our time, and now the rest is mine and mine alone. I can do whatever I want to do with it, and we have forgotten that that day is consecrated unto the Lord. I realize I didn't, I just didn't, I, I, I realize I just did not fail, I, that I failed to give you some good news here. I realize that this comes down as hard news. But let me tell you something, the day belongs to him. He's granted you six other days, hello. It's like if somebody told me one day, he says, well, you know, Pastor, you don't understand. The reason I don't come to church is because it's my only day off, and so I have to sleep and rest. Yeah, they got part of that right. They got part of that part right. I don't know about that. You just failed to grasp the whole idea of what the Lord's Day is about. So now, we must therefore guard the Lord's Day. We have to guard it. We must not gather, that is, work on His day. That is the day that belongs to Him. We must set aside one day a week for rest and holy worship, just as He commands. So there's a day of rest and worship. Both things must take place. So I got a, two points to deal with here, there on this issue, okay? This is before we get into the details of this particular commandment. I had to set this up, I had to take time to give some background so that we get a clearer picture of what is being discussed here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. A, we are to keep the Lord's day. It's not optional. It's not up for consideration. It's not up for a family vote. It's not up for a vote by your friends or your community, or your culture, or the society, or the mall, or the baseball team, basketball team, the soccer team, the football team, or whatever other team that you happen to like, or whatever activity, is not up to the world, it's up to God. We are to keep the Lord's Day because He has commanded it. He did not ask you to consider it, to pray about it. He didn't ask you to, to, to draw a family vote about it. It's a command. So. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. 
And look at what he tells us very clearly here in verse 8. He says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it to keep it holy. It's clear to keep it holy, sanctified. Okay? See, each seventh day belongs to who? To you? To you? To you? To you? To me? No. It belongs to whom? To the Lord. That's who it belongs to. Okay? And we're not supposed to work on that day, but we're to set it apart unto him because it is holy for rest and for time devoted to worship Yahweh, Jehovah Almighty God. That's what it's set up for. Go to Exodus chapter 34, please. In Exodus chapter 34. And I want you to see this with me. It bears repeating because it seems like today things going through one ear and it goes out to the other, or it doesn't even register, and you got this blank look on people's faces. Look at Exodus chapter 34, <coughs> verse 21. Again, notice the command. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. Now, can you imagine? How important it is to plow and how important it is to gather in the harvest when it's coming. But even during the harvest season, everything is to stop on his day. And you see this violation taking place all the time. Even then, look at Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. And I, and I tell you how people get around this, you know, that, because, you know, we love legalism. We just, we, we just love legalism. I mean, we love it to the nth degree. And so here's what, here's what the Christian farmer will do. He'll, he'll hire a bunch of farmhands, a bunch of employees, okay, field workers, okay, and by and large, and many of them may not be believers, okay, and he's got them working in the field on the Lord's day while he goes off to church into a picnic. So he's fulfilled, okay, technically, legalistically, okay, the letter of the law, okay, but has violated the spirit of the law because work continues on his behalf. Isn't that what we do today? You know, you might be an owner of a business, hello? No, 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 I'm about to make you uncomfortable. Okay? You, you may be the owner of a hamburger place or, 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 or beauty shop or, or you may be the owner of a clothing store or a grocery store or you have some kind of a business or a gas station or so forth and so forth and so forth. You go, well, I'm not working, but your business is open. You got people working there and they do not honor God on that day because you got them working on the day that you have chosen for it to be a holy day. Hello? 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 Are you out there? Are you still there with me? I need you to keep this in mind. Okay. Go to Isaiah chapter 56. And look at what he tells us here. And, and because this chapter is dealing with the rewards of being obedient to God. In Isaiah chapter 56, look what he says in verse 2. He says, How blessed, how blessed is the man who does this. The Son of Man who takes hold of it, who keeps from what? From profaning what? from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. How blessed is the man who keeps from what? From profaning the Sabbath, and look what it says, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. See, I told you that this section will not make you feel comfortable. This is quite confrontive. You know, that's what's supposed to happen you know, when we come to church or we come unto the teaching of the Word of God. The Word of God is to, is to drive, is to ha it's going to have a clash effect. It will conflict with us and we will have a conflict because it's going to confront us with the truth of the living God of the living Word. Amen? Now, in that same chapter, in Isaiah 56, go to now to Isaiah 58. Notice what happens here. Now in 58, it's actually an interesting chapter here, but let's look at verses 13 and 14 and look at what the Word of God says here. And actually, because this section is dealing with keeping the Sabbath, keeping that day of rest holy unto God. So look at Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14. It says, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot, 
from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways. Look what it says. Desisting from what? What does it say? From your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, hello, and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Spoken. Amen? The second point. We are to do good on the Lord's day. We are to do good on the Lord's day. You, you, remember, you remember under the Pharisaical law system, under that system of the Pharisees, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, they rebuked Jesus because on the Sabbath he had healed someone. You remember that? And, they, you know, he was doing good, but they rebuked him because now they got really legalistic. Hello? You know, the, the Pharisees failed to tell you that, you know, as, as, they were, as they operated and moved in out of the temple and out of the synagogues, they had other people working on the Sabbath. You know, little details, just like a lot of Christians today who own businesses, you know, and they, and they say, well, my hands are clean. You know, I've kept the Sabbath. I kept the day, the Lord's day. I'm in church and I'm this and I'm that. But meantime, they get the employees working back there who failed to honor God on the Lord's day. Well, the Pharisees had done the same thing. And in fact, they turned around and accused Jesus of healing somebody, okay? And Jesus said, well, let me ask you something. If your donkey falls off the cliff, you know, and off the side of the road, would you not try to rescue him? If a sheep went off, wouldn't you try to rescue him? So he called them on it. He called them on it. But notice this. What is supposed to happen also on the Lord's Day? We do good. We do good. Now, I realize that that's a strange word today in a society where mediocrity and bad seems to be exalted greatly. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 12, please. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12, please. And I want to draw your attention to this in Matthew chapter 12. Note what the scripture says to us here in Matthew chapter 12. And we're looking at 12, 12. But let's back it up to verse 9. Verse 9. Because this is the controversy I just finished describing to you. In Matthew chapter 12, look what takes place here because there is this great controversy taking place here. Departing from there, in verse 9, chapter 12, Matthew, departing from there, he went into their synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? Isn't that wonderful about religion? Don't you love people who are legalistic? You know, in their legalism, they just hide their nonsense and expose yours. Look at this. And they ask this question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to do good? So that they might accuse him. That's what they were doing. See, they had held to an interpretation okay, that was so strict that it always benefited them. And look at verse 11. And he said to them, this is Jesus responding to them. He says, what, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. So he's calling them on it. Would it be bad to leave that sheep there? Possibly injured? Or would it be good to rescue him? And Jesus is calling them on it. He said, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? See, this is what legalism, legalism upholds, okay, mediocrity, a minutiae to a height above man. Then he said to them, so he says, is it lawful? So he says, how much more valuable then is man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. This is Jesus declaring openly here that it is is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. This is clear. There's no misunderstanding what he's saying here. Then you see in verse 13, then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and was restored normal like, like the other. See that? That's absolutely incredible. But the Pharisees went out, he says, and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Isn't that incredible? 
So Jesus declares here in Matthew chapter 12, okay, in verse 12, he says, How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He declares it. Some people will have you stripped naked, sitting in, a, in your prayer closet the entire day on Sunday doing absolutely nothing. Meantime, the house is on fire. Doesn't make any sense. Go to Mark chapter 6 now. Go to Mark chapter 6 and notice this with me in Mark chapter 6. And here we have, here we have a tremendous thing that's taking place here in Mark chapter 6, okay? And I want you to see this, okay? Because here uh, Jesus is in a state of being rejected, rejected by the people here in Mark chapter 6. And so let's, let's go ahead and let's start in verse 1. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown and his disciples followed him. Now, he's home. How would you like to go back to your hometown and experience what Jesus experienced? And look what happens in verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him, such miracles as these performed by his hands? This is, this is taking place when? On the Sabbath. Now, in our case, it would be the Lord's Day. We have chosen as a church, okay, the Christian church worldwide, that the, our Sabbath, our day of rest, would be the Lord's day. That's when we come to our temple, to our church, to hear the word of God, because the, Lord, the Lord's day belongs to him. The Sabbath belongs to him. It is it's given unto him. We give it unto him, and we hear his word being preached, and there may be some miracles taking place that day. Is it lawful to do good? Well, according to Matthew 12, 12, Jesus Christ said, yes, it is. So look at what's happening here in Mark 6. When the Sabbath came, in verse 2, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him, such miracles as these, as these performed by his hands? Now, they began to question him. They began to question who he was. They began to, to, to ridicule, and literally what they did was they ridiculed the day of Sabbath. Was, they had no clue what they were doing. Look at verse 3. He says, is, is this not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and, and, Joseph and, and, and Judas, uh, Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They were offended for the good that he was doing on the Sabbath day. They were offended at him. Now, is he not the Sabbath? And Jesus said to him, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he wondered at their unbelief. I wonder how many of us are experiencing the same today because so many come on the Lord's Day with such profound, okay, callous unbelief. Go to the book of John, chapter 7, please. The book of John, chapter 7. And note this with me as well in John, chapter 7. And let's back up here in... Um, let's start in verse 14. John chapter 7, verse 14. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. And he said, If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who, seek, who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Then verse 19, now look at what he happens. He says, did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Jesus Christ did not mince his words here. And he says, why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Isn't it amazing? You always blame the devil, right? And in verse 21, Jesus answered, and answered them, and, and he says, I did one deed, and you all marvel." For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the what? On the Sabbath, 
you circumcise a man. He called them on it. He says, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. The Israel had a problem with this Sabbath concept back in Exodus chapter 16 when they were exiting Egypt. And the Jews up until the days of Jesus had this problem with the Sabbath. And we today have the same problem. We're no different. Look with me in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, look what takes place here in John chapter 9. And look what happens here in verse 14. And we have this great healing taking place of a blind man. Start with verse 13. They brought to Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, look at verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath. It was on the Sabbath. It was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. See, they were all upset. They were beside themselves because it was done when? On the Sabbath. On the Lord's day. Yet Jesus declared that it was lawful to do good. Look at Acts chapter 16. Go to Acts chapter 16 with me as well. And I want you to see this as well here. And I, 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 this begs the question to be repeated over and over again so that we have a greater understanding of what's supposed to, supposed to take place. Look at Acts chapter 16. And here we have, okay, um, remember Lydia? She was baptized, remember, in Philippi? Look what happens in Acts chapter 16. And look at verse 13, starting verse 11. So putting out to sea from Troas, where ran, we ran on a straight course to, to Samothras, and on the day of following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we, were staying, and we were staying in this city for some days, and on the Sabbath, what happened? On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside, where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the woman who had assembled. And what happened? He was accused for doing such a thing on the Sabbath.